Doctor, sure. the Right Honourable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, my dear friend. Sure. The campus principal, ministers of state, members of the diplomatic corps, the Ghana High Commissioner to Trinidad and Tobago here present. Sure. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Sure. From the moment we ascended the golden stool of the Asante Kingdom, we have been conscious of the role destiny has played upon us to reconnect with every land where the seeds of our heritage have been sown and to encourage and help tend them to flower. Sure. Through the pain and agony of our history, through the incomprehensible destruction of the slave trade and humiliation of colonial subjugation, Millions of our sons and daughters were thrown into bondage across the seas centuries past. Sure. The mind cannot comprehend the partiality of the combined enterprise. And nations and peoples who today constitute one formidable estate of modern society. Sure. Whenever I have thought deeply about that episode in history, I have been reminded of the battle cry of the Asante Kingdom at the height of its power, as one of Africa's greatest warrior kingdoms. Sure. Asante Kotoko, Ukuma Pema Pembeba, translated to mean Asante Kotoko, if you kill a thousand, a thousand will storm back. Sure. Sure. And it represents the kills of the porcupine. That battle cry speaks to the unconquering spirit of our people. And I see it fully reflected in the Caribbean islands, in the United States, in Brazil, in Suriname, and yes, in the heartland of Europe. In these far-flung lands, millions of our own perished at the hands of slave masters in heart-rending circumstances. But far from being swept into oblivion by the tide, their seas have germinated, proudly bearing the glorious fruits we hope we behold today in Trinidad and Tobago and the many beautiful nations of the Caribbean. Sure. Sure. Millions now stand tall over the ashes of the martyrs who fell, testimony to the undying spirit that says Ukuma Pima Apimbaba. Sure. 
Just as our spirits cannot be broken, so we cannot be divided or estranged by, from our heritage. It is the reason we place great importance on our relations with the Caribbean island states and why we are thankful to Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Raleigh, for the opportunity to undertake this visit to your enchanting twin island. So. In 2008, nine years after our coronation, I paid my first visit to these isles, to Barbados, just was confirmed by my dear friend, the Vice Chancellor. I was privileged on that visit to deliver the commencement address at the Barbados campus of the University of West, West Indies. I particularly honored, therefore, I am, I feel particularly honored, therefore, on this visit to be given another opportunity to, to address this Trinidad campus of this great university. So, sure. Principal, thank you. So. Sure. The Prime Minister has invited me principally to be the guest of honor at this year's Emancipation Day celebration. Zero. To join him and the people of these islands to celebrate the historic day when millions of our people were unshackled from slave holdings and set free to live as human beings. That event has to be the most momentous in history if you remember that it was supposed to bring to an end the most extraordinarily vicious enterprise perpetrated by man upon another. So, and I believe it deserves to be celebrated with the same degree of earnestness as any other universally celebrated event. So, that event was in 1834, only one year shy of 190 years, long enough, one would have thought, for its objectives to have been cemented in history. And yet, even as we hear out the event, there remains the potent issue of whether emancipation has delivered on its promise. So perhaps it cannot be out of place today to share some thoughts with you on living with the post-emancipation challenges. I recognize this is a massive subject and you will pardon me if I keep it within a rather narrow frame, but I do hope there will be enough time to stimulate further discourse. Sure. It is important to recognize at the outset that the emancipation story is conjoined with the African heritage and its impact, therefore, is inseparable from the African experience. So, I will argue, therefore, that you cannot separate the conditions of Africa today from the conditions of the Caribbean, nor can you isolate the afflictions arising from the pervasive challenges of discrimination and racial inequality from the challenges confronting Africa and the Caribbean islands. So, this is because all these afflictions have grown from the same root, and notwithstanding the geographical and social differences and the different stages of development evident, especially on the continent, we all have been bitten by the same virus, and the consequence is the same wherever we may be. So, it is crucial, therefore, to be aware in order to understand the African condition that we never ignore and indeed always remember our common historical experience. Understanding the historical experience is the first step towards the discovery of what I would call the social penicillin that gets to the root of what has become endemic, an endemic condition. So, we should not take for granted that the experience is too obvious for all to see. In the mid-1970s, Distinguished British soldier and academic who was once Commander-in-Chief of the British Army of the Rhine, General Sir John Hackett, wrote a book in which he sought to construct a scenario of a Third World War, of what a Third World War might be. So, he opened the chapter on the cradle of conflict with a British ma major asking his fictional general what he thought history would say about the comings and goings that had precipitated the war. The general replied without hesitation, history will lie. So, it was the opening sentence in the chapter about the Middle East and Africa, and with true insight, he concluded that the general knew what he was talking about. It's almost as though when it comes to the experience of Africa, truth is fated to be casual, casualty. Avoiding the beaten track of truism, as the Australian sociologist Hannah Arendt would say, 
is a long established attitude towards Africa and her heritage. So, we are either the exotic pebble some white man found in a forbidden land and managed to shape into something useful according to his tastes, or we are just some subhuman human species guided into civilization by some truly selfless European servants of God. So, Africa is either the land of colonialism where faithful Europeans toil to elevate from primitive existence into the light of civilization, or simply the continent of slavery from where slaves were sold to serve the world. So, by the dominant narrative even of today, nobody would be thwarted by believing that both colonialism and slavery are specifically African phenomena. So, nothing could be farther from the truth. So, since the beginning of time, when humans learned the art of food gathering and began to organize themselves into communities, a sense of rivalry has persisted which gave rise to conflicts. The classical Roman scholar Seneca saw this as avarice which he blamed for destroying the ideal of the com communal society, creating the divide between wealth and poverty which became the original source of conflict. Avarice did not stop with the relations between individuals. As men were organized into communities and communities became states, the acquisitive instinct manifested itself in the aid for conquest of one another. So, kingdoms rose and expanded into empires, and empires like kingdoms also rose and fell. The story of the human race was inevitably, has it inevitably become a tale of wars of conquest. Wars of conquest led to colonialism, a system of governance involving the control of one geographical state by another. So, wars also heightened another phenomenon that has been with us since antiquity. Soldiers captured in battle were often held in or sold into slavery. So, we do not need a full thesis on political history to demonstrate that there is not a single state today that has never experienced colonialism. So, suffice it to say, England was a colony of the Roman Empire for four centuries. All the countries of Europe, Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, and the Vikings of Scandinavia have taken hands in subjugating each other. The United States of America needed a full-blown war to liberate themselves from the British, from British colonialism. So, as I have already alluded to, Slavery, even more than colonialism, has been with us since antiquity. So, whether you view the world from the perspective of biblical text or the mountains of literature from the age of the alphabet, the phenomenon of slavery has been present during every phase of human development. So, the point I make is to vigorously dismiss the notion so embedded in our minds that Africans or peoples of African heritage are species fated to be subjugated and enslaved. So. So. And yet, it is the African experience with colonialism and slavery which is at the root of our problem. For while the twin phenomena of slavery and colonialism may be universal and pervasive, African experience of them has been of an infinitely different order of magnitude and inhumanity. So. With the possible exception of the Holocaust, no event in human history has descended to the depth of bestiality which characterized the transatlantic slave trade. So, and nothing in colonial history has any parallel with the ignominious scramble for Africa, when European states simply ob oblige themselves to the luxury of carving up a whole continent and sharing it among themselves like a piece of cake. So, the closet to the scramble for Africa, one can point to must be the horrors of the Crusades, so, from which grievances the world is still suffering principally in the Middle East. So, it is impossible for any group of humans to endure the combined effect of bestiality across the Atlantic Ocean and the special cruelty of the colonial experience of the continent without intrinsic psychological damage and much worse. And yet, when emanci emancipation came, it was the perpetrators who were compensated, so. and not us. The victims were left to themselves. Yes. 
not only was no possibility of support available, but crucially, no consideration was ever given to the consequence of the centuries of trauma and suffering. So, let us step forward and think about what is happening in our world today. We have had our share of conflict since the Second World War from Vietnam to Iraq to Afghanistan. In the aftermath of these conflicts, the world has discovered something amazing, a condition called post-traumatic stress disorder. So, the experience of veterans from modern combat have left physical and mental scars that require scientific treatment. And happily, the men and women of science have been able to to the task and have found the appropriate treatment for them. So, and the world has discovered that it is not only from wars that the affliction can strike. So, Post-traumatic stress syndrome is now a, rec a recognized medical condition for which appropriate treatment is available. So, If post-Vietnam, the world of science has discovered post-traumatic stress syndrome and has found the appropriate treatment for it, Dare we ask, dare we ask, what of post-emancipation? So. Or indeed, post-colonial psychosis? Can it be, or is it too late to identify scientifically the physical, psychological, and social fallout from the hellfire of the pre-emancipation experience and the appropriate remedies for it? So. J.K. Galbraith, the respected American diplomat and intellectual, reminds us in the most moderate and scholarly tone that no memory is so deep and enduring as that of colonial humiliation and injustice. So, Both the pre-emancipation and the post-emancipation experience evoke memories greater in its impact upon the people. So, Leaders of the black emancipation movement like Marcus Garvey, the W.B. Du Bois were unrelenting in asserting that emancipation on its own could be of no effect without a conscious effort to liberate the minds of the people after centuries of subjugation and dehumanization. Zero. But as we know too well, no evidence exists of any effort to address the challenge of liberation from the psychological, intellectual impact of the twin evils of slavery and colonialism. So, and the situation is compounded by the continuing spectra of racism from which peoples of African descent continue to suffer globally. So, the failure of the post-emancipation experience to address the challenge of the mental and psychological liberation of the people from the combined effects of slavery and colonialism cannot be dismissed as a factor in the struggle of hard-pressed leaders of Africa and the Caribbean to be mourn and grapple with perceived lack of ambition, so. low esteem, and a whole range of conditions directly linked to our historical experience. So. These constrictions evoke mixed emotions for the heritage of Africa, nearly 200 years after emancipation. On the one hand, emancipation and the end of colonialism in Africa have changed the face of the world. So, what could be more inspiring than to see some one of, some, one of us eyes in the highest political office on the planet, as Barack Obama did, when he was elected president of the United States, or to see Colin Powell in overall command as chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the most powerful armed forces in the world, so, or my own Busumuru Kofiana, as Secretary General of the United Nations. Zero. Today, the entire continent of Africa has been rid of the colonial attack and engaged with the rest of the world in freedom. <laughs> Governments from the Caribbean to Africa are striving against heavy odds to lift their people onto a new level of prosperity. Zero. The seas of our heritage are doing a great job in the lands from where we were once colonized, determined not to be held down any longer. But the challenges remain and often truly daunting. So. But even while engrossed in the struggle to shake off the effects of post emancipation neglect, to overcome poverty and uplift the living standards of our people, it remains my view, ironically, that our experience shines a brighter light on the path to global peace. So. The world does not often remember, often remember that the troubles in the Middle East today are the result of the unbroken chain of calamities dating back to the Crusades in the third century. So. 
the seeds of ancient grievances are still bearing their poisonous fruits on the world. And to particularly the, the children of both victims and perpetrators are suffering, su suffering their killing effects in the streets of Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan and Palestine. In Europe, perceived grievances of recent history have ignited fires that have already shredded the certainties of recent times and almost returned the world to the dangers of the Cold War. So, contrast this with the example of Africa. Nelson Mandela walked out of Robben Island to embrace the symbol of the pinnacle system that had incarcerated him for 24 years Zero. and held his people in the bondage of apartheid. Long before Mandela, my own grand uncle, King Premper I, had been seized and sent into exile to live in distress and humiliation. Zero. He returned home 29 years later to hold out the hand of peace, love, and reconciliation. Today, as the 16th occupant of the Golden Stool, my people are proud of the mutual friendship we enjoy with the British Crown. Four times we waged war against the British to resist their attempt, colonial, attempt at colonial subjugation, but we have come to terms with the course of history, and better still, we are fortified in our belief that the courage to wage war is meaningless unless it is backed by the wisdom to make peace. Zero. That is the broader promise of African heritage. <laughs> the harness which Africa throws to a world currently drawn in a sea of conflict, of course. We have our little skirmishes mostly, the result of difficult social and economic conditions, but overall, the commitment of the African heritage to the path of peace and reconciliation against all the challenges of our historical experience should be a lesson the world cannot fail to recognize and behold. So, it should be evident from what has been said so far how complex the post-emancipation and the post-colonial experience has been. But the most important point that arises for me, which is what I need to stress, is the challenge to take hold of our own, of our own and create our own narrative. Much of the literature of the past have so twisted history, distilled odiously convulsive philosophies, and peddled such fraudulent and nauseous science and co the conscience of the Western scholarship can hardly be freed from moral turpitude. Zero. We celebrate with the world the beauty of classical civilization, of Athenian democracy, and the enduring works of Caesar, Socrates, great empires were rising, beginning with the Songhai Empire, the empire of ancient Ghana from whom my country took its name, and the Mali Empire. The strength of the Muslim religion in West Africa is the result of the ancient ties between the civilization of the north and west of the continent, from the east to the south. Other great empires flourish in Africa in general. Historians have chosen to ignore these remarkable events and to rather consign the African experience at best as an appendage to the story of European ad adventurers and at worst as some subhuman evolution. So, it is a travesty that does not have a place in our time. So. But we should not be complaining, just complaining. History has not been fair but it should not hamstring us to our past. We should be capable of mastering the energy to rebuff the misconceptions of the past and build a better world for ourselves. The examples we have cited should inspire us to build inclusive societies where peoples of all races and religions share a common destiny. Sure. We should take pride in our heritage, in our past, in our resilience and in, the, in our capacity to survive the strings and arrows and still stoop to conquer. So, the Africa, which is the cradle of mankind, remains today the future of mankind. So, I thank you very much and God bless us all.